how you doing? Here and back in New York after a little trip to Florida to do another video and uh, holy lord it is the opposite of Florida here it's freezing I got all the gear on I could I guess I'm right out of a freaking L.L. Bean catalog, but uh, you know, at least I got the dollar coffee today. Yeah, it's a dollar coffee. It's the, the dream is alive. You can't buy from any of the chains. You got to buy from the, you know, the little carts and stuff. But Eric, how are you doing? Doing good. Great. Well, today we're going to be doing a video of a neighborhood you might not even know exists. It's called Hudson Square. It, uh, some people call it West Soho. Some people call it Greenwich Village, but it's really just the area from 6th Ave over to the river from Canal in the south to West Houston in the north. Uh, and if you're thinking, oh, Tom, that doesn't really exist. You're just making that up. Uh, uh, well, first of all, uh, don't ever even think of interrupting me again. And second of all, it does exist because ask the people who live here, work here, ask the business improvement district that's named itself that, whatever. There's history here. There's a story here. So it's worth telling. And just remember, I mean, East Village, West Village, those didn't even exist in the 1800s. So, you know, cut me some slack. Eric, what do you think? Should we start this thing? Slack officially cut. Let's go. All right, let's do it. I, I don't want to spend too much time, so let's go. Let's get started. We got a lot to cover. Okay, so this neighborhood here dates back pretty far. Uh, I'm actually here behind uh, 330 Hudson and what's called Old Jan's Alley because this used to be John Seals's plantation. This is one of the original land grants. And they say that this little alley here with that little sign there is, uh, you know, mapped out just like it was behind uh, his, you know, buildings and homes or whatever and it laid out in the same way. Anyways, most of this area is owned by Trinity Church. Trinity Church, which is uh, the church down on uh, Wall Street and Broadway. Uh, it's where Alexander Hamilton is buried. We're gonna talk about that a little later, a little foreshadowing, Eric. Huh? Cool. Uh, but Trinity Church actually owns uh, a lot of land here. They, uh, they were granted land in 1705 by Queen Anne, 215 acres. Here, Tribeca, other parts of the city. Uh, they're one of the largest landowners in New York and the richest parish in the United States because of all of that land. So, for all of you uh, who don't believe, just know that God is real, a state. Nice. Thanks. Uh, but yeah, a lot of this land's still owned by them, but they're a big uh, landlord in the area. And this is uh, Old Jan's Alley, and uh, you know, continues on through the 1700s, but it was mostly farmland. It was an area known as Lispinard Meadows, uh, for Lispinard Meadow for a, a long time, then it actually bled down into Tribeca as well. Uh, but it starts to get developed in the 1700s, just a little bit, little homes and stuff like that, and we'll talk about that as we go. Should we keep moving, Eric? Keep moving. Uh, let's go, because it's cold. So this area also has a kind of a Revolutionary War era history. We talked about how this used to be farmland and all that, but it slowly started to kind of get developed uh, as people kind of moved out towards this area and New York became an American city. Uh, so this is actually the Ear Inn. It used to be the home of a man named James Brown. It was who was the, the aide uh, in battle to George Washington. And he's actually depicted it in Emanuel Lutz's uh, you know, the, the painting of, of Washington Cross in the Delaware. Pretty crazy, huh? And this, this guy's James Brown. Uh, and if you're thinking, man, Tom, that's just a lot of dudes' names, huh? And that's because, unfortunately, this is a man's world. Wow. That was pretty good, right? It was pretty good, Tom. Thanks. Anyways, uh, this was actually his for a little while. After he died, it actually became a bar. And also, keep in mind, the water used to reach up right to this bar, pretty much, right to this little uh, structure. So it's been filled in over time. Uh, in the 1800s, it was taken over a man named Thomas Cook, used to sell beer out of this place. Uh, and also, once the 1900s hit, it actually took a lot of different turns. As, as Prohibition hit, this was actually a speakeasy. The actual upstairs apartment went through a lot of different uh, incarnations. It was a boarding house, it was a doctor's office, it was a brothel. Uh, you know, it sounds like the trajectory of, you know, uh, a kid's childhood bedroom when he goes off to college, I guess. Uh, you know, got a lot of different existences and incarnations of it. Uh, but it's ear in because 
this building is obviously landmark because it's so historic. And when you get landmark, you got to go through lots of red tape to do anything. And the owners of the building wanted to change the name because it just said bar. And uh, they thought, you know, to avoid the whole lengthy process, they would just, you know, black out the B and make it ear. Ear in. Uh, also, interestingly enough, this is supposed to be haunted, Eric. Do you know that? So they say that a former, uh, so this used to service all the like, you know, longshoremen, by the way, keep in mind, you couldn't see the water back in the day. This was all piers, yeah, all the way up the west side. And all the longshoremen, all that stuff would come in and hang out here. And one of them was a regular here, his name was Mickey. And they don't know exactly how he died, uh, but they say the place is still haunted here. Uh, so one of the things that they've heard uh, happens is he actually, believe it or not, uh, goes around and uh, harasses waitresses in the past. That's what they say. They say like he'd grope waitresses and bartenders. <laughs> I guess, uh, you know, hashtag, uh, you ever been me too by a ghost? Uh, that's a real hashtag time's up. In more ways than one, because he's dead. Right nearby is where a man named Aaron Burr had his home called Richmond Hill. So he actually built a mansion here and uh, actually, you know, left that mansion to go fight his Little duel in 1804, his cute little duel in 1804, July 11th, with uh, good old Alexander Hamilton, uh, who I talked about earlier, because uh, this land was owned by Trinity Church, where he's buried, and he shot him. The second shot, he fired second after Alexander Hamilton and killed him in cold blood, baby. He's a cold man. I guess you can call him Aaron Burr. Oh, God. <laughs> and Richmond Hill was right there. Uh, it's been, it was torn down, actually, after he shot Alexander Hamilton, go figure, wasn't a very popular guy. The uh, land, uh, he actually uh, leaves, is kind of booted out of the city, is bounces around all different places. We talked about him actually in a different video. Uh, remember that, Morris Jumel Mansion, Eric? Yes. There's your little plug, you, you freaks. Go watch that one when you're done with this one. Yeah, that video is still haunting me too. Uh, but uh, that was taken over actually by the Astor family. We've talked about him in so many videos, including the Astoria video, because it's named after him. Come on, go watch these videos at some point. But uh, they eventually tore it down and uh, you know built up a little area around there, which we will see uh, as well here in a second. <laughs> you know, this is all date back to pretty far back, which is pretty cool. Um, I don't know, Eric, what do you think? Should we keep moving? I think we should keep moving. Let's keep moving. So as the early 1800s started to develop out here, so did the neighborhood. People were moving out of what's considered New York back then, which was Lower Manhattan, and they were moving out. Things were getting developed. I'm actually in front of what is called the Soho Playhouse uh, because this was built in 1826 uh, by John Jacob Astor, actually, who owned the land here. Uh, went through lots of different incarnations, but this is typical of this neighborhood. So this little area is called the Charlton King Van Dam Historic District. This was the fourth historic district named in New York because uh, this was all developed by different houses at different phases to house people who were moving out of a uh, boring old town, downtown in lower Manhattan. Uh, then you have this little neighborhood that I was saying, the Charlton King Van Dam Historic District, which is different phases of housing that were built to accommodate people living here. The phases are, one is the federal style housing, which was built around the 1820s and you can see those houses uh, what makes them federal is the Flemish bondwork, which is the brickwork, and also the dormers that pop out from the roof of the buildings. This is a really cool little detail you should remember because when you're on a date around here, you're walking to your date after going to, you know, uh, the Soho Playhouse or something, and you point those things out, that's gonna, that, your date's gonna marry you on the spot. Or they're gonna call a cab and haul ass on the spot. It's a risk, I'm not gonna lie to you. Uh, but, you know, pretty cool information either way. So that's the first phase you had, the, the federal style housing built around that time. Then the mid 1800s come and you have the Greek Revival townhouses built. You can still see those uh, as well. Those are also landmarked, obviously. And then you have the tenement buildings, all kind of cohabitating in this same area. The tenement buildings came later also when immigrants started to pour in, uh, in the second half of the 1800s, later 1800s, etc. So pretty cool how all those different architectural styles uh, coexist. So this building is the Soho Playhouse. I told you the building was finished in 1826, but it became in the 1880s the Huron Club, which was specifically for Tammany Hall, which I've talked about in the past. It used to be headed by William Boss Tweed, huh? The famous corrupt dude. Uh, also, you know, catered to Irish immigrants. They used their clout to then put people into office who then give them favors. 
pretty, pretty sweet uh, setup they had. Uh, then it also, it also housed a, a man named uh, Jimmy Walker, who you see, he's not the dynamite guy, he's the, he's the actual mayor of New York uh, in the 1920s, was kind of the hotshot mayor, greased his hair, had an affair. Wow, that was a lot of rhyming, that was pretty cool. Amazing. Oh, thank, but he, was, he did all those things, he used to hang out with celebs, uh, and then he got caught up in a scandal, shock. Uh, but uh, in the 1920s, it also then became a speakeasy, a theater speakeasy. Uh, and uh, also the upper floors, while it was a speakeasy in a theater. Any guesses as to what could have been up there, Eric? Brothel. You're a hornball, but you're right. So it became a, a brothel in the upper floors. Uh, then in the 1960s, it becomes the Playwright Units Workshop, uh, which a man named Edward Albee produced a lot of people here, like Lanford Wilson, Sam Shepard, who, uh, who wrote a great play called True West. Have you ever heard of that play, Eric? No, I haven't. It's a great play. All you, all you playheads are like, Tom, we all know that one is an obvious one, but uh, you know, it's good anyway. So, you know, take it as a recommendation. That's a good little wreck. That's off Broadway we're talking about. Edward Albee said, uh, famously said that people go to Broadway to look and people go to off Broadway to listen. That's a good quote, right, Eric? It is, yeah. And then I guess people go to off, off Broadway to use the restroom or something or use the Wi-Fi. I don't know. I mean, technically this is off, off Broadway and off, off Broadway is less than a hundred seats and you're there and you're kind of squatting, so that counts. Uh, anyways, uh, yeah, so Playhouse, pretty cool. Here in the uh, Charlton King Van Dam Historic District, which is a very cool thing to see when you're in the neighborhood. Should we keep moving, Eric? Let's keep moving. Let's keep moving. So as the 19th century progressed to the second half like many neighborhoods in New York, this became a, uh, an industrial, more industrial neighborhood uh, for a few reasons, but I'm standing here next to 315 Hudson. Uh, this used to be the Henry Hyde candy factory, huh? This is where Juji fruits were invented in 1920. The first pack of Juji fruits came off the assembly line, huh? Uh, and somewhere someone is still picking those same juji fruits out of their teeth but it was here and this was one of the many little industrial uh, businesses that kind of opened up around here so in the 1870s you had the elevated railway making its way through here uh, this was the predecessor to the subway it actually went from lower manhattan up 9th avenue and passed right through what is uh what was then i guess becoming hudson square uh it was the predecessor to the subway you know i mean before the subway, where else were people supposed to, you know, clip their toenails on the way to work? It was the elevated baby and it passed right through here. You also had the printers. This was actually known as the printing district for a very long time in the early 1900s. Lots of printers set up shop. Different buildings were built to support these massive printing presses that were tons and tons and, uh, and heavy. So they needed big, thick, you know, uh, you know, reinforced floors and all that crud and, uh, you know, big open spaces, which are now today millions of dollars in apartments and stuff. You also had things like in 1924, uh, WNYC opened up shop here. It's still headquartered here. WNYC is the public radio for New York. Uh, great. You got to listen to WNYC. If you like New York stuff and also world stuff, you got to listen to it. Uh, and that's right. I am listens to public radio years old, so, uh, you know, don't judge. And different uh, developments also helped spur this on and, and contributed to this, which we're going to see in the next little uh, segment. But uh, yeah, it became more of an industrial area. Printing in the early 1900s, printing district, very, very common way to refer to it in the early 1900s. Should we keep moving, Eric, and talk about some of these developments? Sound okay. off in the comments. So, yeah, sound off. Smash that like button, sound off in the comments. So there are certain developments in this neighborhood that have kind of changed this trajectory or influenced the way it's developed. Uh, and I'm standing in front of one of them. I'm in front of one of the entrances to the Holland Tunnel. Uh, think about how incredible this is. This thing goes to a depth of like 90 feet under the Hudson River. It's 8,500 feet long. And it was the first actual connection to New Jersey. Uh, and it was finished in 1927. November 13, 1927 is when it opened. Uh, Pretty crazy. Uh, in fact, there's four different buildings with 84 fans uh, that basically in every 90 seconds completely replace the air down there so people don't just choke on all their you know, fumes and stuff. These giant buildings that just basically 
you know, evacuate all the disgusting air uh, on, on either side. Uh, we got to get one of those things for outside of Eric's bathroom, right, Eric? <laughs> Roasted. Interesting fact also, 1949, there was a huge uh, disaster inside. A, a, a truck carrying like these chemicals caught fire uh, and, and a firefighter died and 66 people were injured from smoke inhalation. So things do happen. Uh, that was the second worst disaster in Holland Tunnel's history uh, behind only the movie Daylight starring Sylvester Stallone. Real two percenter joke there. <laughs> yeah, not many people are going to get that reference, I guess. It's a movie about the tunnel that sucked. It was the first mechanically ventilated underground tunnel in the world. Isn't that crazy? Uh, and 13 sand hogs died building this thing. In case you don't know, sand hog is just the name for the workers who deal with building and digging tunnels around New York. There's a whole world underground. Isn't that crazy? Subways, sewage, you know, uh, tunnels for cars, water. All of these things are taken care of by the group that's called the Sand Hogs. It's actually a union that takes care of all the workers who deal with this. 13 Sand Hogs died building this thing. Very important. Very uh, unheralded and, and forgotten group of uh, very hard workers here in New York. Kind of cool. Sand Hogs is kind of a cool name, too. We should come up with a name for what we're doing, Eric. Better than YouTuber. Something better than YouTuber. What about, like, uh, what about video pigs? Or video pigs. Well done. Thanks. All right. Well, this is the Holland Tunnel. Very important development in this neighborhood. This is the entrance to the Holland Tunnel. Today there is the Lincoln Tunnel and also obviously the, uh, the, the George Washington Bridge connecting to New Jersey as well. Uh, so, but this was the first one, first vehicular crossing to New Jersey. So very important development and, uh, you know, not the most scenic part of the neighborhood, but very important nonetheless. And I ain't just taking you to the, uh, you know, best Australian, Asian, Mexican fusion tapas restaurants, you know, with bottomless mimosas or whatever. I'm taking you to the cool stuff. Who's and, giving you a tour of the Holland Tunnel? Where else are you going to go? Yeah. What other, video, what other videos are going to, you know, show you this gorgeous sight? <sighs> All right. Let's keep moving. So the neighborhood has changed. I'm here to talk to you now about the present day of this neighborhood. Uh, I'm at 565 Broom Street. This is a building that was designed by Renzo Piano, a Pritzker Prize winning architect. For those of you guys who don't know, the Pritzker Prize is like the Nobel Prize of architecture. You win it once a year. When you win it, it's basically cha-ching. I'm going to go around the world and just design big, crazy buildings. And uh, people aren't going to question how ridiculous they look because I am famous. This is one that's designed by Renzo Piano. He's the guy who designed the Whitney Museum. I don't know if you know the name Renzo Piano. Maybe you know his uh, less famous uh, younger brother, uh, Giancarlo Harmonica. Uh, this building is uh, one of the many buildings that have gone up since 2003 in this neighborhood. Over 18 uh, residential buildings have been built. Big ones, big condos, very fancy, very getting expensive. But because this neighborhood is nestled between uh, Soho, Greenwich Village, and Tribeca to the south, uh, this is actually a, believe it or not, a more... Uh, value-oriented neighborhood. Uh, yeah, no, no. a one-bedroom for almost two million dollars is good value here. Uh, go figure, that's how expensive the neighborhood in uh, Manhattan is getting. But it wasn't always like that in the 1970s, just like most of Manhattan and most of New York, this area was run down. So artists moved in, things like the Film Forum huh, opened up on West House and Street, a very cool nonprofit that's still there. Uh, makes most of its money off grants and donations, so it's able to show good movies. What a shock. They're not uh, beholden to all the superhero movies and Matrix sequels. <laughs> Eric, you like uh, Film Forum, don't you? I love the Film Forum. It's a great place. I'm going to go ahead and just give you guys that little plug. It's a great date. And you might be thinking, oh, that's Greenwich Village, that's West Village, yeah, whatever, man. Remember, there are different boundaries. Different people have different boundaries for neighborhoods, whether it's the people who live here, the business improvement districts, the historic districts, there's all kinds of, you know, so just, you know, take the information. Anyways, uh, so in the 1970s uh, was kind of run down. Then other businesses started moving in. Different tech businesses actually started moving in uh, more recently. Uh, and in fact, like Warby Parker, Harry's Razors, uh, Oscar, the, uh, the healthcare. Uh, an important, I guess, 
uh, thing happened as well. In uh, 2009, the Business Improvement District was created for this neighborhood, a Business Improvement District. This is important, Eric. A lot of people don't know what these are. Uh, you walk around New York City, you walk around Manhattan, you walk around even parts of Brooklyn and Queens, and you see bubble things uh, with the lights in them, and you see signs that say, welcome to the neighborhood and all this stuff. Those are the Business Improvement Districts. They are these nonprofit groups created uh, by the, basically, and funded by the landlords and the people who own property in the neighborhood. They are contentious because on the one hand, they are uh, good. They clean up the neighborhood, they provide security sometimes and all that stuff. On the other hand, they are non-democratic. Like these are people who own in the neighborhood. They aren't, uh, I guess, uh, accountable to voters. They aren't accountable to the democratic process. And they're basically funded by landowners. So if you're a renter and they, you disagree with what's going on, well, tough luck. Uh, so it is something that's important to know that because most neighborhoods in Manhattan and most and a lot of more and more neighborhoods outside of Manhattan are basically uh, using this model and they're all over the country now. This rezoning just recently happened in 2013, very important because that's what opened it up to lots of residential buildings and lots of developments along those lines because before that it was hotels and commercial. Uh, so it's changed the neighborhood a lot and the value of the neighborhood has gone up a lot. So that's it. That's uh, kind of how the neighborhood's changed in the recent years and how it continues to change after the rezoning uh, gets more expensive, etc. But uh, yeah, I ain't owning no property just yet, but one day I'll own some property somewhere. Maybe not here, but uh, we'll see how the Patreon does. Right, Eric? Uh, living the dream. Living the dream. Anyways, uh, yeah, I don't know. I guess we'll keep moving and uh, wrap this thing up here. What do you think? Right, let's, let's get the hell out of here. I scared you. I scared you. Should have seen your face. Uh, anyways, we made it to the end here, guys. I'm actually over on West Houston Street, uh, kind of bleeding into Greenwich Village here. But uh, yeah, we covered all of Hudson Square. Uh, talked to you guys about the history, how it started out as pretty much, you know, meadows and farmland and Cherney Church got a big chunk of it. Then I talked to you guys about how it got started to slowly get developed into little residential and things in the early 1800s, throughout the 1800s and the mid and the late 1800s, it became more industrial. You had things kind of start to develop there, printing district, you had the Holland Tunnel, and today it's being kind of touted as a, a new alternative to Tribeca, Soho, and Greenwich Village, and things like Disney, Google have made their headquarters there. You have all these residential buildings going up. Uh, pretty fancy, pretty expensive, you know. But uh, we covered a lot. Before I uh, sign off, uh, guys, please check out the Patreon if you enjoyed this. Um, that helps. That's how we fund these things. Uh, that's how this is going to grow, baby. That's how this is going to grow. I have given too many thumbs down to too many massive chains to ever get an endorsement for anything. So, and nor do I really want one. So you guys got to help me out because that's how uh, that's how this is going to sustain itself. Anyways, uh, also like and subscribe to the video at the very least. That helps as well. Helps bump us in the analytics ahead of all those, uh, you know, uh, reaction videos. You know? Maybe I should start doing reaction videos to my own videos, Eric. What do you think That's of that? That's a good idea. That would be pretty cool, huh? That's content. That's what the kids want. They, everyone wants content. Amazing. Speaking of content, Eric, now we finished. Why don't we go take in some, uh, some content over at the Film Forum? I don't think they have any content there. It's all content now, right? I mean, Martin Scorsese is just as much content as, you know, uh, Logan Paul, I guess, these days. Uh, it's all content. We're all just content. Anyways, not to leave on that note, um, I hope you guys enjoyed it. I always love doing these things, so, uh, you know, till next time, right, Eric? Until next time. That was a weird way to sign off, but, uh, you know, it's all whatever. All right. See you guys later. Sick.